Most of what we do to try to get what we want is sabotage without us realizing it. And not just about the goal. It's disturbing that boundless peace that is natural. And it's not right or wrong or good or bad, because I, I want to make that really clear, because most people listening to something like that will go, well, he's saying I shouldn't have goals. No, I'm not saying that at all. You, will, you either will or won't. <laughs> I'll even give you a written guarantee about that. <laughs> but, but when we pursue a goal, there has to be a separate me to pursue it. There has to be this sense of a volitional entity that's apart from the whole to pursue a goal, because the whole is the fruition of all goals, yet it doesn't have any. Welcome to the Mind Tracks podcast with breakthrough ideas to live your best life possible and how to make it happen. I'm Paul Sheely, and today we'll be talking with Hale Dwoskin. Hale is a New York Times bestselling author of the Sedona Method and a featured teacher in the Letting Go movie and the Secret movie and book. Hale has dedicated his life's work to sharing the Sedona Method, a simple process for releasing painful or unwanted emotions on the spot. This scientifically proven technique enables a whole new way of being naturally happy and at peace every day. It serves as the foundation for the letting go paraliminal that Hale created with me, which you can find on the MindTracks app. Hello, Hale. So good to be with you. Thanks for being a part of this podcast. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure hanging out with you in any form. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm looking at your background. I'm seeing that beautiful mandala behind you. And I'm, I'd am i like to talk with you about the practice of meditation. Because sure, sure. You know, the science is in. Everybody knows we should be meditating. Not everybody it creates a time in their life to do it. But I'd like to talk with you about your history with it. When did you first get into meditation? Uh, in my teenage years. I don't know exactly when, but I was pretty young when I first uh, was introduced to meditation. I think the first meditation I ever did was in a yoga class. It was at the end of the yoga class. Uh, and I closed my eyes and I don't even know if there was a mantra involved, but as soon as I closed my eyes, my uh, body's uh, sense of being embodied disappeared. <laughs> so that was my first experience of meditation. And, and then, did you think, I want lots more of that? Of course, of course. That's what most of us do when we have a little taste or glimpse of something beyond. We go, I need more of that now, please. please, please, please. <laughs> so at the time I liked it. And, um, and it came a kind of a touchstone as I started meditating. It didn't happen that often. It happened occasionally. Right. Uh, and, and I went through various meditations. I went through, let's see, if I can remember. I did TM for a short period of time and it didn't resonate. That was after that experience. Yeah, being, <laughs> trans, being transcendental meditation. Yeah, transcendental meditation. Yeah, when I when I first got started in meditation, I was in my late teens, 18 years old. It was super conscious meditation was a class, but it was through Raja Yoga, it was uh, you know, the eight rungs, and I learned yes, yes. meditation through that. And I became a Hatha Yoga instructor. But what I, I understood that you really got into it. You even traveled to India at some point, didn't you? Yeah, later in life I did, but it wasn't based on meditation. Uh, my wife and I uh, met a man who did Panchakarma and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was, uh, so we went for a, a regiment of 
of healing where there was intensive massages and herbs and all that other kind of stuff. That was uh, actually, incidentally, it was uh, right before 9-11. Oh, wow. Uh, and we were actually in India when 9-11 happened. Wow. Uh, so that was a very interesting experience. And, and especially getting back, it took a while to get back because at first everything was closed down. And on the way back, we um, we uh, we flew into LAX, and it was like a ghost town. There we uh, we flew. I can't remember what airline we flew, but it was a nice airline. Almost like after the pandemic, everything was a ghost yes, town it was, then it, as well. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, I, I think it was even more extreme. I mean, I think I was on a Southwest flight with twelve people on it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, and there was also piles of going through um, all of a sudden on the way out, you know, there wasn't any big deal about security on the way out. There were piles of little the scissors and nail clippers and all these weird things by the, where you went through uh, the checks and stuff. All of those dangerous weapons. All those dangerous <laughs> weapons. That's right. That's right. Well, now, getting back to your practice of meditation, what kind of discipline did you maintain in those early days? I, you know, it, it's hard to remember because uh, I was only 22. So I started as a teenager and I experimented with various uh, forms of meditation and also things like rebirthing and yoga. I did a lot of yoga. I did Tai Chi. I did actualisms. I did a bunch of different things to shift consciousness besides just sitting quietly with eyes closed. So I, it was all mixed in together. And then I learned the Sedona method in uh, at age 22. Okay. And, and that became, I, I stopped meditating at that point because right. life became a meditation. Everything in life supported that that peaceful centeredness that I used to think I had to meditate to get. So I just started uh, using the Sedona method and it was something that I did in a disciplined way for decades, most of the day. So, All right. so let's, let's talk about this kind of a shift. What was it about the releasing method and, and I guess, also, your meeting with Lester Levinson, learning it. What was it about that experience that caused you to turn toward this releasing process? Well, the results. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember in 1977, I was walking through... Times Square, and this is before it was gentrified. There weren't all the big billboards. It was kind of a pit. I don't even know why I was there. I think I was coming after a Broadway show or something like that. And ordinarily in the past, before I learned releasing, it would I would have been really kind of uptight being there because it was dark. There were peep show places and pimps on the street, and it was a mess, homeless. And in the past, when I'd been in an environment like that, I was in a, always in a very contracted state and was in a hurry to get through the that. But what happened is the sense of me disappeared and this, there was just walking and a sense of profound, unshakable peace. I don't remember how long it lasted, but it really caught, I can still remember it to this day, it really caught my attention. <laughs> And so it, it, the, the combination of having a personal relationship with Lester and all the support I got from him, because anytime I did anything with Lester, there, there was just this energetic inner opening and lift that was quite profound. And then the practice itself, no matter what was going on in life, I found that I got quieter and calmer and more focused. And I, I found uh, all the same benefits as meditation, uh, except that I wasn't technically meditating. 
uh, or, or I wasn't doing the typical meditation practice. And the results were rapid and cumulative and I haven't left to this day. <laughs> <laughs> and now I don't really have a regular practice. Life is just live, basically living itself. Very cool. Yeah. So I want to I want to get at that idea. There's something about releasing, which I came to understand in meditation, that when a thought occurs, or in your case, as a feeling occurs and a thought yes. occurs, that there is a, a watching it, there's an observance of it, and there's a letting it come to pass that you don't attach to it. Is this is this what the practice enabled you to do more easily? Oh, yes, yes. There, there was really early on, there was more and more of a sense of witnessing that was yeah. not just while releasing, but in life. There was, there was a sense of life unfolding and there was an inner sense of just sitting back and with a sense of welcoming or allowing or, or just simply watching. And this again went on for decades. The, the, the witnessing has only recently fallen away uh, to more of a sense of just nothing <laughs> and everything. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, the, I want to then try to show the contrast between living a life of allowing or welcoming whatever emerges compared to what I encountered when I first got going in self-improvement, self-development, yes. where we were really being taught to visualize and see a goal and affirm our capacity to get to that goal and yes, work yes. towards it and be yes, all yes. in and all of that sort of thing. What is the the difference for you is, is what when is that kind of a practice actually obstructive compared to really enhancing one's journey through life well it really depends on what it is that that someone wants if you want more money then then focusing on manifesting more money can be a useful endeavor. If, but if you're wanting to, and it's not an if, because you can have both. It's not, it's not an either or, it's an and. <laughs> and at the same time, this sense of beingness or this beingness that all is, doesn't require us to help it live life. It is already living through everything you me the digital device that you're or that you're listening uh, through the the it's living through your thoughts your feelings your experiences it's it is life itself and it's not personal it's just universal and that has no goals it's ne it's never had a goal yet as a person in life it's natural for that to arise. And as long as you're, you're pursuing it in an integrous way, where instead of just simply trying to manipulate life, but you're, you're opening and surrendering and allowing, then goal achievement can be a natural part of life's unfoldment, just like anything else. Yeah, so let's take a moment with that because you use the word want or desire yes. and goal. Yes. And there's also the idea of attachment. Yes. When we become attached to our desire ring or our desire to something that we don't currently yes. have, there seems to be a bit of a twist in the energy that I'm getting, at least by implication of what you're saying, might not be all that helpful 
to creating what it is you're actually desiring. Absolutely. Most of what we do to try to get what we want is sabotage without us realizing it. And not just about the goal. It's disturbing that, that boundless peace that is natural. And it's not right or wrong or good or bad, because I, I want to make that really clear, because most people listening to something like that will go, well, he's saying I shouldn't have goals. No, I'm not saying that at all. You, will, you either will or won't. <laughs> I'll even give you a written guarantee about that. <laughs> but, but when we pursue a goal, there has to be a separate me to pursue it. There has to be this sense of a volitional entity that's apart from the whole to pursue a goal, because the whole is the fruition of all goals, yet it doesn't have any. So there can be this feeling of being contracted or out of harmony pursuing a goal that may arise, but it's, it's, that is also can be transcended. And in that, the goal itself may disappear or not. The goal itself may happen or not. But either way, you, there is a sense of well-being. There's a sense of openness. There's a sense of, a sense of expansion and ease that can become unshakable. And it gets shaken when we have thoughts about, wait, I had this goal. It didn't happen. What's wrong with me? Why can't I seem to get what I want? You know, I've got this extra weight. I've got this bad bank debt. I've got this, that, this, that. I want to get rid of it. I want to stop it. Yes, yes, and, absolutely. And in all of these mental machinations, what happens is we end up getting ground up in the gears of all of that. Yes, so, that's how so, it feels. So the releasing starts with the release of the attachment of the outcome, or where does it where does it start? Does it start in just looking at those thoughts or where? Well, actually, releasing starts wherever wherever there's a, there's a sense of your finger in the gear <laughs> or your foot or your head. Most of us have our head and our, and head. our gut in the gears. <laughs> right. And so the set, what, what releasing is really is just a sense of opening, a sense of allowing, a sense of non-clinging that can happen spontaneous it does happen spontaneous in life spontaneously in life however with with the, the Sedona method what happens is you're 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 trained through you learn several processes that help make it easier and easier to do so the goal of the process is not so that you're doing a process your whole life the goal is to just re get re in touch with that natural openness and exuberance that we come in with. Young children don't need to be trained to be exuberant and to be open and to be alive. <laughs> right. We actually train it out of them uh, it, big time. And, and so the, the Sedona method helps you dissolve that excess programming or training. And what also can happen as you, as you release is there could be this sense of boundlessness or ease, even if there are thoughts, even if there are feelings. At first, you feel like you're freeing yourself from your mind and from your attachments and aversions. And th that can feel amazingly liberating. But it doesn't stop there. The, the sense of a you who's being freed starts to thin and dissolve. And then there is just, and there already is, freedom or boundlessness or beingness. Or, and that needs no maintenance, needs nothing. That's and nice. It is everything. And I, I always saw that the practice of meditation, many people would elevate their consciousness to this high and holy place and then descend back into the world <laughs> big time right? yeah a, yeah yeah with a thud yeah and, yeah and one of my teachers said the goal of meditation isn't to raise 
your life up to this high spot and then, you know, go deal with the world is to raise everything about living to that high place where you recognize it wherever you are. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's um, that ability to let go of the expectation that it should be some way other than it is brings in a lot of things like appreciation, gratefulness, and love, and contentment, and joy, and peace, and all of those other delightful experiences that are natural to us on an ongoing basis. Absolutely. It, at first, it feels like the, the act of releasing or letting right. go is bringing that forward or or uncovering it. And then it's, it can be discovered that it, it is just what is naturally, with or without anything. It just is. Whether, and, whether we're there trying to make it or, or not. Yes, the less we're there trying to bring life up or bring it down or open, or the less there is that sense of having to uh, do anything with gears, even get your finger out of them, the gears themselves dissolve <laughs> nice. and there's just life living itself. And a lot of times people hear things like that and they think, oh my God, how am I going to take care of my life if I'm not there to manipulate and control it and all that stuff? Well, you're, you're not there already. It, it's just an appearance. Life is already living itself beautifully. Nice. Yeah. Even when it seems to us from our limited perspective that it's not going the way we want it to, but it, it's still life living itself. That's and that includes everything that's happening. But, but, we but only everything. Only everything, exactly. <laughs> Just everything. <laughs> there's, there's this phrase that uh, Bill Levesey uses, a Sanskrit phrase, intention, attention, no tension. And our friend... Marcy Shimoff really picked up on that. And if we could establish an intention and bring our attention to it and then go about our day with no tension within us, yes. life tends to follow the form that we've established for it to fill in. Does that make sense? Is that it, it makes total sense from the perspective of being a, a, a person. Absolutely. And, and it also appears to work within the dream of me. It definitely does. Except that the absence of tension is really the only, <laughs> the only really important part. <laughs> right. Intention will happen or it won't. Attention will happen or it won't. Often we try to maintain attention. And in doing in doing so, we get really tense because oh no, I wasn't I wasn't paying attention just now. I was just living. Oh my God, I got to pay attention. <laughs> but yes, the the t those three things are can be incredibly helpful. If if we feel like a person in a life that that needs to be manipulated and controlled by us. Then, then absolutely, that is a, an incredibly helpful and powerful tool. Incredibly helpful and powerful. Yeah. And there are so many tools, both, uh, I, I know you teach a lot of them and they're amazing. They're, they're incredible. And, and meditation itself is taught in so many places. And for quieting the mind and calming the body and allowing for the, the space to reveal itself to itself, it's it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, it seems like the workshops that you do continue to just roll on and continue to grow. And is it more relevant today than it has been in the past? What's happening with humanity that makes the concept of the uh, the Sedona method, being able to release and be present, what's emerging, so key for humanity at this at this moment. Well, it, I, I don't have to tell anyone listening to this that there's a just a touch of tension in the planet. 
just a tiny bit. <laughs> and it's not just happening in the United States. It's happening all over the world. There's a polarization and, and almost an energetic tearing apart that's happening, both to the planet and to us as human beings. And I think it's just part of the natural evolution of systems growing and yeah, decaying. Yes. Yeah. yes, absolutely. But also there's a it with that, there is an openness that's happening, uh, uh, a willingness to not just cling to the old ways, to the not just in life, but in internally. We most of us by the time we're teen uh, uh, young adults We've established most of the patterns we're going to, internal patterns we're going to live with the rest of our lives. And we never question them. It's just the way it is. And what's happening now is I think there's more and more of an openness to questioning all of that, to, to being open to the possibility it doesn't always have to be the way it was. So what the Sedona Method does is it helps support you in that in that exploration. So, and you can start to see where there's still contraction within the body-mind system, where you're still holding yourself back, where you're denying yourself, where you're staying in a, a state of hypervigilance or in opposition to things that don't agree with the way you want it to be. And it's a very uncomfortable position to live in. And as that drops away within you, as you let go, life, even if it's not going the way you would want it to, can take takes on this openness and this sweetness and even joy at times and at transparency. So it's not all, in, all consuming. And it makes everything easier. It makes, yeah. and, and, and it's so needed now. It's yes. so needed. Well, and I, I've been describing this great turning in human history. It does seem to be, in terms of general systems theory, a critical moment in the human family. So it it does make a lot of sense. I We had our grandchildren sleeping over a couple of weekends ago, and the little three-year-old at the time woke up in the middle of the night quite agitated and Libby gave me a little nudge to go, <laughs> to go handle it. It was your turn. <laughs> right. so, so I got up and I, and I simply laid down with her and put my hand on her and said, it's okay. It's okay. She was gone. She, I mean, instantly gone. Right. And very often it's what we say in hospice when it's time for someone to pass. It's yes. okay. Yes, yes. It's okay. And it, for me, the Sedona method is, it's going to be okay. Whether you're busily trying to make it okay or not, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. It's okay. Just let it go. It's okay. Yeah. And when we do, I I love the this, idea that the the wellspring of life that's always trying to emerge and continue to expand is no longer held back by my efforting and saying that it's not okay right the way it is <laughs> it's interesting it, it was never really held back by that but it makes it much less fun <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> life is <laughs> life is infinite and boundless. My, yeah my experience of it i'll say my oh yeah absolutely the is, experience is held up held back. yeah ex experience can be very different yes than than what is actually uh, happening very so, different so of all of the techniques you know that one of my favorite in the sedona method has been the triple welcoming yes, yes. you and i did a paraliminal based on that and I'm wondering if you could explain to our listener what is triple welcoming and why it works the way it does. Oh, sure, sure. I'd be happy to do that. So triple welcoming 
is basically the the whole Sedona method. Uh, well, most of the Sedona method. When I uh, in early nineties, uh, Lester Levinson passed all the copyrights to me, and he said to me that as you work with this, it's going to get simpler and a lot more powerful. And mm-hmm. I, I didn't believe him honestly, <laughs> but I, I what happened is through being in front of a room working with people the the process continued to ev- evolve and unfold and i discovered that uh, you trying to drop something sometimes even that's too much and just welcoming or allowing or being present with whatever was arising was incredibly helpful and we, so that's one of the tools that we teach experientially. And, and I also discovered that there are certain places that we get stuck. And again, this happened just in working with people. I didn't like, I didn't think about it. It was just presented. Oh, I see. Here's a pattern. And if you repeat this pattern, it really helps people. And so uh, the three places we get stuck, we either get stuck in the story of what's happening, in that there's a certain event, we're sure it's not going to, it's not the way, it, 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 it isn't the way we want it to be, or e- even more neutral than that, it's so, something is happening that, that may or may not be something we like. So the first thing that, that is welcomed is just whatever is apparently happening. And then the nature of, of the person, when we feel separate, we think we need to fix it, change it, control it, understand it, do something with or, without or about it. And that's about everything. What our body is doing, what the news is saying, what politics is doing, how much money we have in the bank, our relationships, our health, everything. And it's, it's from when we, the moment we wake up in the morning until when we go to sleep at night. There is this constant thinking that something needs to happen. Something needs to change. This is this, whatever is apparently happening, isn't right. It, and so if you welcome this tendency to feel like you need to do something with or about it, that also starts to dissolve. And then lastly, all of that is hooked to just one misconception that it's all happening to me. This sense of ownership, the sense of I'm the knower, I'm the doer. I, I'm, I, it's all about me, basically. We think the, the whole universe revolves around what we want or don't want. And when you welcome that, that also starts to dissolve. And when you welcome the three of those together, it, it has this very profound unraveling effect on whatever apparent limitation you're dealing with. And so that's triple welcoming. That that's that and it and evolved just simply through working with people and seeing what really helped. So let me just get a final bit of clarification on it. It's very clear that there is some resistance happening when we're not welcoming it. And if we're resisting it, then it's going to persist in our experience. Yes. And if you welcome it, the resistance goes away. But you, as you say, it dissolves or it unravels. Yes. To what? Back to life as it is? Well, it, it, to... it was always just an appearance. The appearance okay. of, of the resistance and the Got contraction it. melts. So any... I- any yes. attachment I have, any story I have about it, any energy I put toward it, if I welcome it, none of that's there. Well, it it it, it dissolves. It, it 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 becomes no more substantial than a, a a ripple in a stream or a wave in the ocean. The in the stream, in this analogy, the stream is the stream of life, the ocean of life the ocean that the ocean doesn't resist the waves it's the waves are just part of the ocean it's just an ocean waving well uh uh the as there's a sense of welcoming and and also if that sense of of 
as that sense of being a separate person dissolves, there is just what's apparently happening. And there, there's no points of, the, the life is just an unfolding, it's, it defies description, actually. Right. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm lost in an image of myself being in uh, the Gallatin Valley in uh, Montana, standing knee deep in a trout stream. Mm. Uh, and just so overwhelmed by the beauty of it all and the water going past me. I have, I have no attachment to anything in that stream. I have a fly rod in my hand yes, and I can fly fish. If someone asked me, did you catch anything? I would think, does it matter that I caught <laughs> right. anything or not? <laughs> that, that's really inconsequential and yes, participating yes. in it as an activity but whether i get to an outcome of it of a fish for the fry pan for lunch for libby and me or not completely unnecessary i'm just right right, right. I'm absolutely absorbed in and the distinction between where i stop or start and where the universe that's so gorgeous all around and within me begins and ends is inconsequential and just part of yes. all of it. A a absolutely. Absolutely. And everyone listening, I'm sure, has their own trout stream. Yeah. I think, there, I think a lot of our activities are often geared toward getting us to that place. For example, Libby is an artist gets into her painting in a way in which she's there. Someone who plays golf releases themselves so completely so they're participating in this magnificent experience. They're somehow overcoming mind. We call it flow, I think, is, yes, is a description yes. of it. Yes, yes. So that and that's what's natural. That what I was uh, what I was going to yeah. add to that is the people don't re, uh, don't pay attention to the flow because it's natural. Mm. We pay attention to to the rocks in the stream, to whether or not we've caught a fish, to how pretty the artwork is. You can't really create if you're. If, at the, if you're judging the art as you're making it, the art makes itself. And, but, but people experience that throughout life all the time. They're, they're just, life is living. And it, it's even in simple things, like even the sense of, of stress, depending on what you're looking at, but even looking at your phone. If you're stressing over uh, something or, your, or the news or a post, then maybe not. But if you just kind of, really engage with the phone, time disappears. Mm. And there is just the phone. And there is no boundaries to that. There, and there really actually aren't boundaries. They just, they just appear to be. And this boundlessness that is already is, is part of the reason, is what we usually are looking for when we do any process, including the Sedona method or meditation or, or listening to paraliminals. Paraliminals also help um, allow there to be uh, a, a taste of this boundlessness. Mm -hmm. And it's just important for all of us to remember, or not, it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter if you remember, but it, that, that is what's already natural. The, the, the paraliminals, the releasing, the meditation is just a pointer towards that which is already. And it's not dependent on that. Nothing is. Yeah. Yet at the same time, all those things can be really helpful and really fun. Exactly. And why not pick the thing that's most fun for you to participate in it, whether it is this, that, or the other thing? Yes. Um, so to wrap it up, yes, knowing that 
all good things must end, at least from our experience. Of it, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Even yeah. though it all continues whether we're participating in it or not. Right, right. Um, how would you like to leave our listener with um, kind of the moral of the story from your own life, from the arc of where you started seeking this level of peace to where you are today, what would you give to our listener in encouragement? So first off, trust the process. Uh, Allow yourself to just love and honor and nurture yourself wherever you are or wherever you appear to be. And allow yourself to um, explore the nature of being. Beingness is what we're experiencing all the time and what is even when we're not experiencing it. And it is already boundlessness. It is already limitless. And just being open to that as a possibility tends to invite you into that more uh, consciously. And, and also just know that the, the bumps, the, the setbacks, the apparent failures, the, 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 the apparent problems that we deal with every day, some big, some small, all of those are like waves in the ocean. They come, they go, and they don't have to limit you in any way, shape, and form because what you are is what all is. This boundless being. And it, it is already wholeness. It is already perfection. And life is just waving at us after all. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a great image. <laughs> it's great. Thank you so much, Hale. Always a pleasure for me oh, to be Oh, likewise. With you. Thank you. Peace <laughs> and blessings. Bye yes. for now. Bye bye. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Hale Dwaskin. You can learn more about Hale at Sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A dot com. And now in the second part of the podcast, it's just you and me. I'll tell you how to use the paraliminal sessions in the MindTracks app to easily handle obstacles and move toward the success you want, especially as it relates to to our discussion with Hale. If you're new to the relaxing paraliminal audio sessions, they use breakthrough technologies to activate your whole mind in only 20 minutes to help improve any area of your life. Let's get going. Hi, and welcome to the follow-on session of my conversation with Hale Dwaskin. As we were exploring the Sedona method, the concept of releasing as a way of meditating and being in the flow of life itself, fascinating stuff. His spiritual awareness is tremendous, his ease and his sense of joy with the way everything is exactly as it is, is refreshing. I hope you agree. And when I'm thinking about putting his ideas into practice, there are really three major topics that came up. One is the idea of releasing. Second is about being able to allow and experience more of what life is actually trying to bring us, to remind us that we have. And the final is how can we actually go about creating the life that we choose to live while being in the flow of life. When I think about the paraliminals that could assist us in each of these three areas, there are quite a few that came up. Certainly foremost, 
the triple welcoming process that Hale Dwaskin and I recorded in the paraliminal titled Letting Go must do. It's really a remarkable experience. And it's something that once you play it and practice it on an ongoing basis, you recognize that whatever is happening, just by allowing it, whatever feeling you're feeling, just allow it. And what it does is it dissolves any of the tension or contraction that might be present around the way you are interacting with it. So it really is a lovely experience. I encourage you to use it, become familiar with it, be able to practice it on your own, whether you're listening to the paraliminal or not. The second area of focus for me is that idea of allowing and really experiencing more of life. Years ago, I created a home study program called Euphoria in which I contacted a number of people. Hale Dwaskin was one of them. And I asked them, if you were to help someone realize more euphoria in their life, what would you teach them? And every single one of those authors that I contact said the same first line. They said, well, euphoria is our natural state. And if someone's not experiencing them, this is what I would teach them. And Hale taught the Sedona method. And I created a paraliminal, same thing. How do we get in touch with that natural state of euphoria, which is our essential nature, the way in which we were born to live into this world? That, as Hale mentioned, gets trained out of us early on in life. So that's one paraliminal. And then there's a couple of others that talk about the essential emotions that are a part of life. Gratitude paraliminal and joy paraliminal are both perfect for this. And then there's a paraliminal called five elements healing. And that takes you through five of the essential emotions that are associated with the various organ systems in the body and with colors and with the emotions, then establishing greater harmony and health and well-being. Uh, And it does take you through those five emotions, happiness, joy, peace and groundedness, contentment, and gratitude. And those five emotions associated with these five organ systems keep us in that flow of life allows us to have a high level of well-being on an ongoing basis. So these, each one of those paraliminals is really intended to put you into the experience of what's more natural to us, this natural expansive nature that is the nature of life itself. Now, Hale talked about humanity getting itself into kind of a pickle these days. Therefore, a lot of these technologies are very helpful to help us see our way through some of the gnarly problems that we have to address. But it is essential to remember that you can't do in order to be. You can't do things in order to be at peace. You can't do in order to be joyful. Joy and peace are natural states. So they are states of being. And so you be that, and then all of your doing will be elevated more easy, more in the flow. You'll find greater sense of self-expression and a real alignment with that natural flow and current that life brings us into the true nature of who we are. And um, I would encourage you certainly to pick any one of those emotions that you feel you may be lacking in. Listening to a paraliminal is going to help you remember that that is one of the natural states within you. The next area of the three areas we're talking about is creating while being in that flow of life. And 
In that regard, I've picked three paraliminals. One which I feel is excellent around understanding the great fullness of life that is. And this is the key message that Hale was teaching. It's also a key message that Lynn Twist teaches in The Soul of Money. And Lynn and I did paraliminal called Soul of Money. Really puts you in that flow. Now, a big fan of Lynn Twist's and a very successful entrepreneur who lives very abundantly in Japan is a man named Ken Honda, and he and I did a paraliminal called Happy Money. It's this idea that here is this wellspring, this bubbling fountain of abundance and prosperity, and we can align with that, allow our, our financial reservoirs to fill, and what flows out once our reservoir is full, we can give and keep in the flow of life for all those that we might serve. So soul of money and happy money are a great combination, kind of a one-two paraliminal that can be very effective in helping us create our lives as we desire while being in the true flow, not stagnant, not as, as Hale called contracted, but really feeling a sense of expansiveness the abundant nature of the universe itself. It is expansiveness. The final paraliminal is self-actualizations. It's based on Abraham Maslow's concept of being self-actualized, which is a five-level pyramid, and self-actualization is the top. But the essential message of this paraliminal is that actually Abraham Maslow was talking about a next level beyond being self-actualized, and that's being self-transcended. Now, if you listen, if you go back and listen to the podcast with Hale, you'll hear this living into a much more transcendent experience of life. It's really transcended the human form, the human identity, and transcended to this more transcendent nature of life itself, which is infinite, expansive, abundant, and is filled with joy and peace and grace and, and love. And that is really the highest expression of who we are as human beings is to come to that self-transcendent state. That's exactly what that paraliminal self-actualizations focuses you on, is how to enter into and live into that transcendent nature that you are. Well, enjoy the paraliminals. Thanks again for being a part of this podcast. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you for joining me today. I applaud your willingness to maximize your potential. You can easily use the Paraliminal Audio Sessions in the MindTracks app to stimulate your non-conscious mind, that is, your inner mind to reduce any resistance in your life, and to propel you toward the success you want. Go to www.mindtracks.com forward slash go. That's www.mindtrax.com slash go. These amazing audio tools have helped millions, and I encourage you to bring them into your world today. Be sure to be back for more episodes of the Mind Tracks podcast. You'll find insightful conversations with authors, experts, and thought leaders, all devoted to improving your life's experience. Thank you again for being here. 
on our Mind Tracks podcast.